Good evening, everybody, and welcome all of you to the 93rd live program on orthopedic principles. Today, our guest of honor is Dr. Oliver Marin Pina from Madrid, Spain. Dr. Pina is the head orthopedic and trauma surgeon with more than 16 years of experience in orthopedic surgery. His current practice is as senior consultant of head surgery in the orthopedic surgery and traumatology department at the University Hospital Infanta Leonor at Madrid, Spain which is a part of the National Public Health System of Spain. Dr. Pina completed his residency in orthopedic surgery and traumatology at the hospital Severo Madrid, Spain in 2004. And in 2013, he was awarded the Minge Cabanella Award by the Spanish Society of Orthopedics. He has several publications about hip pathology in international journals and chapters in different hip surgery books. He's the author of the book, Femoral Astabular Impeachment, published by Springer Wallag, He's also the editorial member in the Journal for Hip Reservation Surgery and the SIGOT Open Access Journal. So today it's my great honor to introduce you to Dr. Oliver Marin Pena from Madrid, Spain. Over to you, Oliver. Thank you very much, Hides. Uh, it's for me a great honor to collaborate with uh, these orthopedic principles. And um, we are going to talk about a very interesting topic that is uh, hip arthroscopy and hip preserving surgery. So as you mentioned in your introduction, uh, I work in a public hospital called Hospital Infanta Leonor in Madrid, Spain. So I usually take care of these young adults with hip pain. So this is our talk about, this is my disclosure that will not affect the following presentation. So as an index of my presentation is, uh, we are going to start with the indications who are so important to, to, to be success with this surgery. And we will divide into differential diagnosis and uh, physical exam. We continue with the surgical technique, how, how to do it, trying to reduce the learning curve and also to decrease the complication rate. So let's start with the indication especially with the physical exam. So usually our patients are young patients, less than 50, and with different diagnosis and come from different colleagues with the different surgeries sometimes. Uh, sometimes they have like a spine surgery or some uh, hernia uh, surgery. And usually the symptoms start slowly. It's not like in this video, it's not so sudden. It's more like, a, look at this left hip. So this is not the typical case, right? So um, what can we see in the standing examination of these patients? So first of all, you have to see the gait of this patient. Also the, the, the single leg stance face test. You have to see this abductor weakness that is sometimes you can appear. Then put the patient seated and then try to analyze the external internal rotation with the pelvis stabilized. And we follow with this uh, range of motion. So if we can see in this position, supine position, and there is a decrease of the global range of motion, be very careful because sometimes in these cases there are uh, excessive uh, degenerative uh, osteoarthritis in this hip. And sometimes you have an increase in range of motion. So also be very careful because this is a hyperlaxity patient very frequently. So also you have to analyze the muscular strength and uh, other parameters in this uh, global range of motion. But we will start with some kind of signs, specific signs, like this roll leg test. You rotate the hip in extension and you feel pain with this mild rotation. Uh, it means that there is a, also a, a probably advanced degenerative stage. Also in this spine position, you can analyze the dial test. This asymmetry, as you can see in this picture between the both legs, can mean uh, some problems in this hip. Look at this video. This is a lady. And you can see how there is an asymmetry between both legs. The problem is not in the right side is in the left side. So the problem is because this patient has a hyperlaxity in both legs, but in the left hip, they have some pain and some reduction of this external rotation. So be very careful. I think it's very important and everybody 
will know this test is the impingement test. You have to do very gentle. You have to flex the hip 90 degrees, then internal rotation, very mild, and then adduction. So that's so important because uh, the, this is a very high specificity test but low sensitivity. So I will continue with this uh, test doing some kind of decompression. I mean, traction of the leg when you are in this impingement position with internal rotation and adduction and flexion, and then you do some traction and the patient release, improve the symptoms. This is uh, the test that has been described by Manuel Rivas in one friend of mine. Also in this supine position, you can analyze some kind of a snapping, medial snapping, or the Thomas test, just to see some tightness in this uh, psoas tendon. Also, you can do the stitch field test, just trying to straight leg uh, and try to rise against resistance. And also the Faber test in this position, flexion, abduction, and external rotation. So this is an interesting paper. This paper comes from Netherlands. And you can see how this lady mentioned that uh, there is a relation between groin pain and impingement test and Faber test. If we see in the intraoperative findings with the hip arthroscopy, where there is a location of control labral lesion. So also this uh, author mentioned that if there is no growing pain in this patient, this is not a FII syndrome. So be very careful with that. If you do a flexion of the hip more than 90 degrees without any rotation, you can assess this subspine impingement, the impingement between the neck and the prominent anterior inferior iliac spine. Also from the impingement test position in flexion, internal rotation and adduction, you can rotate the hip to external position and extending the hip. And you can check the area of the damage of the control level junction. So also you have to examine the patient in the lateral position just to check the sternal and snapping hip or any other pain in this area. And also in the prone position, you can assess the posterior pain related sometimes with the hastrim or ischial bursitis or sciatic nerve. I recommend you to use this kind of templates or, or any kind of templates to collect all the data from the physical exam and try to analyze and try to get a good, uh, perfect diagnosis. So let's continue with the differential diagnosis in these patients. So for example, this is a typical case that come to my clinic. This is a 48 male, they come to the clinic. I just check the x-ray before the patient get into the clinic and I say, oh, it's very obvious. The problem is in the right side. So it was wrong. I mean, the problem of the patient is in the left area because there is no pain in the right side. So there is no a correlation between osteoarthritis of the hip and pain. So be very careful with that and, and be aware that many, many times we have this finding. And you can see these two papers. There's a relation between x-ray and pain in the hip. Only 10% of the patient with hip pain have any radiological degeneration. And only 20% of the patient with hip osteoarthritis has any pain in the hip, in the groin. So be very careful. There is no a good correlation between x-rays and pain in the hip. So you have to rule out any problem in the back, in the spine, uh, like uh, also some problems with the sacroiliac joint or the knees that are related to these hip problems. And also you have to rule out some problems in the lateral side, I mean, in the external part of trochanteric area, or maybe the deep gluteal syndrome. Sometimes you have this uh, bursitis or, or uh, trochanteric uh, pain in this area related sometimes with this problem with the tendons, the gluteus medius, and you have to repair in this, these problems sometimes with uh, these endo endoscopy techniques. But be very careful, especially in old patients, because you can find these problems in the MRI, but there is no pain in this area. So do a correct physical exam and sometimes you need this surgical treatment. Also this deep gluteal syndrome with some problem in this posterior part, in this buttock, in this area that there are some compression of the, of the sciatic nerve 
or any other problem around this area. And uh, also try to examine this in prone position, these problems in the, in the hamstrings that sometimes require some surgery. So if you have any doubt about the diagnosis, you can do uh, infiltration articular injection with some anesthetic or corticoids, and you can rule out that the problem comes from the joint or external to the joint. So if the problem comes from the joint, you can see sometimes synovitis or ligament interis problem, sometimes free bodies or instability of the, of the hip. But usually, especially if you do an MRI, you can see these isolate lateral lesions or contralateral damage. So be very careful because this is very frequently in the radiologist report, but you have to examine the patient and try to find this growing pain associated to these radiological findings. So you know that the labrum, labrum is, is a, a very important structure in the hip, and they have some kind of a nerve ending in this area, in this transition between the labrum and the cartilage in the acetabular side. That's very important. You will see in the next slices. But the labrum has this uh, seal uh, function in the joint. And it's very important to keep this, uh, this fluid inside the joint because when you have uh, a normal function of this labrum, you can see these degenerative changes in the joint. So be also very careful with this uh, blood supply to the, to the labrum. That's important because when you do surgery, sometimes you deattach this labrum and you can damage this blood supply and you can uh, reduce the, 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 the lateral healing with this, with this maneuver. So you can identify these lateral lesions, but these are not real uh, uh, lateral lesions always or very frequently, they are associated with a chondral damage in this area. This is the transition between the labrum and the cartilage in the acetabulum. And this is the weak area where every damage starts. So be very careful with these bubble signs when you see in the arthroscopy view or the chondral labral separation in this area. Also these pocket lesions, when you can put your proof inside this, this, this lesion. And finally, in the last stage, this is the chondrolabral flap. So that's important to identify during the hip arthroscopy. But be very careful, as I told you, more than 50% of these isolate or supposed isolate labral lesions are associated with any bone deformity. So you have to look for it. And uh, sometimes you have a vascular necrosis, perthes like deformities or dysplasia. There are other videos in this uh, channel uh, talk about dysplasia. So I'm not going. I'm not going to go deeper in this topic. So you have to measure these angles and try to find, because sometimes the damage of the labrum is very similar that other pathologies like femoral impingement. And you can do in these cases of dysplasia, this osteotomies, periacetabular osteotomy to correct this uh, under coverage and try to, to, to restore the anatomy of the acetabulum with these surgeries, these open surgeries. So that's important to identify. But finally, it's very common that the patient comes to a clinic with a diagnosis of femoral acetabular impingement. So what's that? This is an impingement, a mechanical problem between the femoral head neck junction and the acetabular rim and the labrum. This is not an osteophyte. So please don't say that. Because when you analyze the cartilage of this deformity, this can deformity, for example, in the transition between the neck and the, and the head, the cartilage is pretty normal or a little bit damaged, but it's not an osteophyte, right? So this is not new. In, in 1936, uh, smith Peterson described this femoral stable in Benjamin, and this is the treatment, maybe a little bit, you know, not very gentle treatment because they resect the acetabular rim and, 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 and the neck, but uh, this is not what you have to do actually. So also I recommend you to read this paper. This is the World Week Agreement. It was a, a few years ago. And there is an agreement between different multicenter uh, doctors and people uh, that take care of this groin pain. So you have to identify these symptoms, signs, and radiologic, radiological findings to say that you have a femoral acetabular syndrome. So try to avoid these terms, asymptomatic FII, avoid that. Also deformity cam or pincer deformity, try to avoid that and try to, to chain into CAM morphology and pincer morphology to assess this 
femoral acetabular impingement syndrome. So you had in these patients, you had to find these radiological uh, signs, but also clinical signs and the symptoms to say that there are a diagnosis of FII. So maybe a lot of uh, people know this. This is the pincer type. This is an overcoverage of the femoral head that usually you can see in the X-ray. You can you have to do a very good uh, technically view AP pelvis just to measure this retroversion. That's important because you have to identify this anterior wall and posterior wall in the X-ray very nicely just to check if there is a retroversion or not. I mean, if there is a over coverage or lateral position of the anterior wall related to the posterior wall. So this is an example, this is anterior wall, a little bit lateral than posterior wall and there is a crossover sign. It, we can see that in the X-ray, we identify the center of the femoral head, this posterior wall related to the ischium and the anterior wall related to the pubic rami. And this is the crossover sign. This is an over coverage. It's a lateralization of the anterior wall over the posterior wall. And also you can see this medialization of the ischial spine in this pincer type, but be very careful. This is a classical paper from Klaus Siebenrock in 2003, where you can see in a cadaver, if you move your pelvis, if you do your X-ray, your AP pelvis X-ray with a bar tonic technique, you can see over coverage and FII diagnosis like this, you move your pelvis and there is a crossover sign and then disappear when you put the pelvic. So be very careful with the pelvic tilt because if you change your pelvic tilt, you can find this pincer uh, diagnosis very easily and operate every patient you want. So there is a software developed by Bern University that can correct this uh, pelvic tilt. This is called hip to norm. So it is a very interesting tool to, to assess that. The pincer type is a co over coverage. So there is a damage in the transition between the cartilage and the labrum in this area and a contracap effect in the posterior part. So this is a video where you can see how the, in this over coverage and the over coverage of the femoral head, there is a damage when you do flexion and internal rotation in this weak area, the weak area between the labrum and the acetabular cartilage. This weak area usually have this problem. This is a, weak area in which every osteotitis start or begin. So with the repetitive mo motion of this hip in this over coverage, you can find this damage in the carriage there and also the contra cap effect damage in, the, in this posterior area. In the camp type is uh, sometimes easier to identify. This is a bone bump in the hand neck junction, usually related to the closure of the proximal femoral physis and also with um, skiffy patients. So you can see this area of closure and this is the area of the cam deformity. This is very nicely see in this epiphysiolysis patient where we can resect this cam, this bump in the transition between the neck and the femoral head. And this is the animation with that. There is a cam deformity that provoke this damage of the cartilage in this area. That's very easy to see this bump that with the flexion of the hip can damage this cartilage and also sometimes they attach the labor. This is a, the video of the same cam deformity in the transition between the head and the neck and how this deformity can damage this weak area, histological weak area between the cartilage and the labor and start these degenerative changes with the cam deformity. The damage usually is deeper than the pincer type so be very careful with these high uh, def cam deformities in this patient, these young patients. So to see this cam deformity, you can see in the AP view, but you need another view. You need a dumb view, axial view, with the, you can see how to do it, flexion 45, abduction 20, and external rotation 10 degrees, but also other views like cross table view, you can see here, how to do it is not very easy for the radiologic and radiology techniques, but uh, but you can also do this frog leg view just to identify uh, this damage. And I recommend you this false profile view to see 
the narrowing of the joint space. That's very important as we will see later. So we can identify this scan deformity with the alpha angle, you can measure that. This alpha angle, if when, when it's, uh, it's very easy to identify and measure, you have to follow the circumference of the femoral head. Then you can put a line with the, with the neck axis and then try to find the place where the anterior part of the bump or the, or the, the shape of the femoral head touch this circumference of the femoral head and measure this angle. So if, if you have more than 55 degrees, maybe it's a pathological alpha angle. Usually this bump, this cam deformity, it's called uh, pistol grip deformity. So you can measure the alpha angle again in this axial view. So sometimes you can see in the AP view, as I told you before, but the, you cannot see, you can do a very easily this 30 degrees external rotation and you can see the right hip again, this is the right hip and you can see how the bump appear in this area. This is very easy to see in this case, but sometimes it's more difficult. So you have to be very patient and they come appear if you do another view, another view different than AP view, but always appear, just be patient. So sometimes you need to, to assess this damage of the joint. I usually put do this uh, arthro MRI with some anesthetic. When you put the, the, the contrast inside the, the joint, you put some anesthetic and you can check also clinically if the pain comes from the joint. With this arthro MRI, you can also measure uh, the, the alpha angle very easily, but also you can see this damage of the chondrolabral junction, this weak area that I told you before. Also, you can see this cyst in the joint, sometimes are related to bad prognosis. Uh, but mainly, uh, as a summary of this part, you have to do the conservative treatment with this patient. And when it fails, you can try to do a surgical treatment for any of the different uh, methods that you can treat surgically, safe surgical hip dislocation, mini anterior approach, or hip arthroscopy. So with any of these methods, this any of these techniques, you have to do this acetabular side treatment with a reattachment and a repair of the labrum. Sometimes you need some kind of resection of the, of the acetabular rim and, and reattachment of the labrum again and, and repair and sometimes reconstruction. And also at the femoral side, you have to do this osteochondroplasty of this bump, of this cam deformity. Be very careful with the vessels that are very close to there. So uh, with this treatment, you have to start this surgical technique. So how to improve your learning curve and how to decrease the complication with this technique. So let's see. The main complication is no clinical improvement for the patient. And the rate of that in this paper was told as 15% of no improvement at one year in very easy cases, then it's zero and then it's one. And 5% of the cases getting worse. So be very careful. Because this technique, hyperthroscopy, has increased a lot all around the world. So look at the UK, that there is an increase of 400% since 2005. And the cost is, is, is very nicely, 6,000 euros. And what about US? I mean, in America, since 2007 to 2011, there are a lot of hyperthroscopy that increase more than 250, especially in very young patients, they that 30, and old patients also. So be very careful with the indications because you have another problems like the conversion rate to total hip arthroscopy. Look um, at this patient that are converted into arthroplasty. So in US, in patients older than 50, 17% need to a conversion at one year. So it's a lot, but under 30, less than 1%. So what happened in our country, for example, we have a, a, a a study group with uh, Spain and Portugal, and we analyze our results in 600 uh, hyperthroscopies with one of our fellowships in, in six centers. So we assess that the, there is a, a rate of re arthroscopy or re surgery of 2.5% and a conversion to total hip replacement at one year of 1%. So be very careful with that because in the literature, you can find at the beginning 13% of complication with this technique. But in high volume centers, you can see 
between 0.5 and 6%. So, and what happened with these uh, complications? There are some complications related to traction. So be very careful with the setup of the OR. I use this kind of uh, transparent uh, surgical field just to check the foot and the abdomen, you will see later. And some people use this lateral position also. It's very good reports with this position, but I like uh, to do it in a, in a supine position. With the supine position, you have to do traction, especially at the beginning, but during the cam resection or the peripheral compartment assessment, you can release the traction and do flexion of the, of the hip. So be very careful with this position. Also, it's very important the traction. What to do? That's what I usually do. I start doing my traction in abduction a little bit. And when I see there is some kind of the, the, uh, destruction of the joint, then I will do adduction just to chain the vector, the force vectors and avoid some complication in the peri perineal area. Sometimes there are some compression there. What I have to see during the fluoroscopy. So you have to check this opening of the joint having said that you, you have to reach this one centimeter of a space there, but also see this vacuum sign with the, like the coaptation of the, of the joint, that's important. And be very careful when you start introducing these dilators and these uh, guide uh, instruments. So at this point, be very careful with some neurological problems when you're doing traction, especially femoral nerve, sciatic nerve, and, and some kind of dystrophy. But also it's very important to have a very good padding in the perineal post to avoid this pudendal nerve palsy and some kind of loss of erection temporarily, especially in this young men's. So in this area of uh, setup of the, of the OR, some tips and tricks like correct setup, be very comfortable in, and enjoy during the surgery, use an extensive uh, perineal post at least 10 centimeters wide, try to reduce the force vector doing traction in abduction and then do adduction. And during the surgery, try to do an intermittent distraction, 45 minutes in the central compartment and then release the traction and try to do some work in the peripheral compartment. Also be very careful during the surgery with the motion of your feet and your leg and your knees, because sometimes you cannot see and that you are doing excessive rotation and you can find some nerve damage in the, in the ankle or in, there is publication about fractures in the ankle. So be very careful. There are some complications related to portals. So also some uh, neurovas neur neural problems like a femoral nerve injury or lat femoral lateral cutaneous nerve, especially when you're doing these portals, these anterolateral distal portals. But when you use the posterior portal, be very careful with the sciatic nerve. So that's important to take into account when you are doing this portal and try to access into the joint. There are some problems related to the breakage of the instruments. One trick could be when you put that this flexible little guide inside and you start with the dilators, if you move the dilators, be very careful because if your little guide is fixed at the tip, you can break it. So try to remove a little bit from the, from the joint when you are introducing your dilators, like you can see in the video, and then continue introducing, push, pushing your dilators there and be very careful not to break this very soft and flexible little guide. So when you're establishing your portal, your first portal, I usually use these two portals, anterolateral and anterolateral, distal anterolateral. Be very careful with the cartilage don't do any scuffy of the femoral head. So be very gentle, have enough distraction of the joint to get your components, your instruments inside. And look at that, be very careful. Use blunt surface instruments and look at that in slow motion. I did some kind of damage of the cartilage of the femoral head. So try to avoid that, being very gentle and have enough space. Also, when you open the capsule, be very careful. When you open the capsule, the capsule, then you can check the other portal. You can check the anterolateral portal and try to open the capsule again under direct visualization. So that's very important. But use the scope, I mean, the, 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 the intensifier 
in this first portal. And don't be very uh, concerned about the x-rays, about, about the radiation, like in this paper that we, we published, that is not so important, this radiation at this stage. So what happened with the labrum? Sometimes you have some, some jatrogenic damage of the labrum when you try to do the portals. So there's no concern if you have a perforation. I mean, when you put your spinal needle through the labrum, this is not important. But also, if you have a damage of the labrum around four to five millimeters, sometimes with the camera, with the dilators, there is some clinical study that two years that say there is no problem with the clinical results. Especially, actually, when many companies have different and very nice and, and secure uh, instruments to establish the portals. And, uh, and, and it's improved a lot in the last 10 years. Also, you have some cannulas like that, that are very useful to avoid this, um, this damage of the cartilage and, and the labrum. So try to find these flexible instruments also to do your hip arthroscopy, that's important. So like tips and tricks in this uh, area, remove the retinal guide when introducing dilators be gentle, use the image intensifier with the initial portal, use these switch instruments very frequently, and also use this specific hip cannulas. What about the, some problems related to the surgical technique? Be very gentle with the soft tissues. As any surgery, you can find some calcification if you are not very gentle. So be very careful with these tendons and, and another lesion, and also you are so rude, you can find some addition that some that are uh, one of the of the of the of the diagnosis for the revision hip arthroscopy. Also, be very careful with the cam resection. Try to avoid this over resection because sometimes you can find, as in, in this picture, these uh, stress fractures. So don't go farther than thirty percent of the neck wide. You can use these new instruments, carve uh, bars and other new instrument that is very easy to, to, to measure this stuff. But in any case, you have to do some kind of partial weight bearing with crutches for three, six, week, six weeks. And if you have old patient or at-risk patients, try to do bone density imaging scan before surgery. Another interesting topic with complication is the instability. Some people call that micro instability, but it's a real instability. Be very careful if you dissect the acetabular rim, one millimeter section is like 2.5 degrees of the coverage. So don't create a iatrogenic dysplasia. Also try to avoid wide capsulotomy, try to reduce the capsulotomy and also repair the labrum. Don't resect the, the labrum because as you can see in, your, in this picture, there is a huge resection of the labrum and, and the capsule opening capsule. And then there is an instability in this hip, this anterior instability for a wide opening of the capsule and don't close, and for this labral resection. So you have to take into account also that in FII, more than 40% of the cases, there is a borderline coverage or under coverage. So be very careful and never go farther than four millimeters of ring resection. There is some cases, very fatal cases of true dislocation after surgery. There are four cases published. Some of them are because the patients are female and with, with hyper, hyper laxity, and then sometimes they do this capsule application. But there are some cases that they have like a huge excessive re re resection, and there is a real dislocation that need a total hip replacement. So try to repair with these new uh, uh, instruments that is very easy to repair the labrum. Also open the capsule very nicely with these new instruments that can open the capsule very, very, very strict. And also repair with these new uh, new anchors that can be uh, very, very useful to, to repair the labrum with a nodal, no, uh, nodeless or, or, or whatever. So limit your capsular opening, repair the labrum, avoid resection more than 30% and use crutches for three weeks. So finally, there are some vascular complications in these patients, like from, uh, if, uh, vascular necrosis. Be very careful when you resect the cam deformity because the vessels, the retinacular vessels, come very close to that, between four and six millimeters close to these cam deformities. 
and also the skin necrosis due to the perineal post. Uh, this is a fatal complication published like one case of, of heart attack because this fluid extravasation, be very careful, try to measure the intra-abdominal pressure during the surgery and, and be very careful with the pump in these in this cases. So how we can improve, improve our clinical uh, results. Can we use hip arthroscopy surgery to prevent osteoarthritis? There are a lot of papers that mention that alpha angle is related to progression of the, of the degeneration of the joint. It's also dysplasia, if you decrease this, uh, this angle under 28, you can increase the osteoarthritis in 30% for every grade or the need for total hip replacement in 18%. So dysplasia is related to osteoarthritis in the hip. That's no good with this uh, works. You can see these different uh, publications about that in the long term, that can deformity and hip dysplasia are related to progression of osteoarthritis in this long term, more than 20 years follow-up x-rays. But there is no, till now, uh, publications related to the, the, the prophylactic surgery. I think you cannot go with this prophylactic surgery because you see a morphology, so be very careful. FII camp type is related to prevent this osteoarthritis in this symptomatic patient, dysplasia also, but pincer type is not published with these long-term results. So what about in advanced osteoarthritis? When you have osteoarthritis like that, less than two millimeters in any point of the joint, there is no recommendation to do this hip arthroscopy. And also it's not, not cost effective. Less than two millimeters at any point is not cost effective. So never try to do this hip arthroscopy in this kind of patients. So in conclusion, we must say that there is main indication for hip arthroscopy and there's an increase in the numbers of indications. Be aware of the proper indication, especially during your learning curve. And also there's a good relation between CAM and dysplasia that lead to osteoarthritis. There are some publications that you can expand your knowledge about FII and this hip arthroscopy. Thank you much. Uh, thank you, Oliver, for that brilliant presentation on hip scopy. And uh, I'm, I'm, I know that you have really experienced on uh, hip scopy and the book on FEI. Very nice to see that. A couple of questions. Uh, one is on uh, fibroacetabular impingement itself. Uh, do you do a diagnostic injection prior to undertaking your surgery? Because you know that a lot of asymptomatic people uh, also ha have abnormal hip morphology because I remember in your journal of hip preservation, there was a paper in February. Am I right? Yeah. yeah okay, it's a good question. There are some controversy in the literature about that. Um, I mean, as I told you in the presentation, I use these uh, in injections during my, um, the, I mean, the arthro MRI. You put the contrast inside. I put some kind of anesthetic in there. So I can check clinically if the pain comes from the joint. But anyway, there are some publications that said that there is not good correlation between these, in these injections and the results of, of the, of the intraarticular uh, problem. So, I'm not sure, really. You need to do a in hip injection in every patient, but I think it's a good advice to do it if you have any concern about that. So try to do it, especially with the ultrasound guide, uh, injection is, is a good idea. And uh, how many of your patients require open surgery? For, for example, if you made a diagnosis of femoral stable impingement, and uh, how many of you patients require a surgical dislocation to address the cam lesion? Yeah, for address the cam lesion, no patients need that. I think you can reach every cam lesion, I mean the standard cam lesion, in a, a standard, in a good indication. Uh, other problem is this patient with this posterior part uh, prominence there, but as I, told you, as I told you in the presentation, with these patients, sometimes there is far away from osteoarthritis. So this is not a good indication to go to the posterior part. So uh, maybe you, you, you must need this uh, surgical dislocation in cases with like a Perthes disease, especially because you need to put the greater country a bit down or maybe correct this um, 
interarticular deformities. But for a standard chem deformity, I think if you are a good arthroscopist, it's okay. But anyway, you have to do what you have to do. I mean, you have to treat this labrum, you have to treat this chem deformity, and you have to use the technique that you can manage. You can do mini anterior approach, you can do surgical dislocation or hip arthroscopy, but please do it. Don't try to do hip arthroscopy just because it's a fashion. And, and maybe you are open surgeon and you do perfectly through mini anterior approach, or you can do it through surgical dislocation. You have to use the technique that you can manage. The other question is regarding the associated acetabular labral tear. So if you have a cam lesion and you have a coexisting acetabular, I mean acetabular labral tear, how do you go about it? Uh, as, I, as I told you in the presentation, it's, it's the same. I mean, especially because I try to focus on that, there is no isolate labral lesions usually. I mean, and this is not a problem of the labrum alone. It's a problem of the chondral labral junction. So that's the, that's the key. I have never seen, well, I mean, a couple of cases, but uh, uh, the attachment of the labrum because of a traumatic problem. Always is at the generation in the chondral labral junction. So the problem is always there, always. So you have to assess and repair this area, and you have to repair the labrum and the contralabral injection with some stabilization. If there's an unstable lesion of the labrum, you can do it with anchors and try to repair this area. So that's, that's important. And do you always try to repair? Or is there a scenario where you're unable to repair and you just do a debridement and come out? That's an interesting question also. If you have uh, this uh, situation, you can see this before the surgery, because in the MRI, in these cases, there is a huge damage. So I think 90% of the cases you can repair the label. And what about the cool lesion, counter cool lesion? I mean, you have a cool lesion at one side and you have counter cool lesion at the opposite side. So how do you address that one? Never, as I told you, if you have counter cap lesions, maybe it's too advanced. You don't have to do hip arthroscopy in these cases. Only some very, very, very uh, low number of cases have this posterior condition or posterior impingement with good and, uh, space. So always is a degeneration, and this is the reason because they fail. Is because there is a bad indication. It's not a good indication in these cases. So when you see a cool lesion as well as a counter cool lesion, how do you approach it? You say the cool lesion, sorry? When you have a dual lesion, for example, you have a cool lesion and a counter cool lesion. And you said hip arthroscopy is not a great procedure in such a scenario. So would you prefer an open procedure then? I mean, as I told you, there is a damage of the cartilage. So and if there is a damage of the cartilage, it doesn't matter if you do surgical dislocation, arthroscopy, or mini anterior. The results of these cases with less than two millimeters, it, for example, in this case, it's very useful to do a false profile. If you do a false profile X-ray, you can see how the space is very narrow, less than two millimeters. And in these cases, it doesn't matter if you do it open or arthroscopy, the results at one year is, as I told you, that's the reason because there is a high rate of conversion rate to total hip replacement in these old patients, is because you don't assess correctly pre-op the cartilage damage. That's the key. Always the failed cases is because you don't assess previously and you did a bad in indication of this preserving surgery. The other question is regarding the pincer impingement. For example, you have made a diagnosis of pincer impingement and there is some acetabular retroversion. So would you go for a, a morphological correction like a periacetabular osteotomy? Or what is your threshold? that you do a periacetabular osteotomy and correct it or you go ahead with the hyposcopy? Yeah, that's, that's a, a good question also. There's a huge discussion between uh, preserving open surgeons and, and some kind of arthroscopists. Um, so you have to assess the posterior wall. If there, if there is a posterior wall deficiency in these retroversion cases, you have to correct, obviously, with a PO, a retroverse PO. So that's, that's very important. Um, but sometimes it's very difficult, especially because pincer type is very difficult to assess correctly because the projection sometimes is not good. And, and I, I, I always have some concern about to address correctly 
the, 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 the retroversion in that case. So maybe in this case, you have to do a, a, a CT, a reconstruction 3D CT, just to check correctly the version of these patients. And that's the key also, to assess if there is a posterior wall deficiency, and then you have to do a, a, a reverse PU. Uh, Oliver, my friend, Mr. Sentel Sambandam, who works in uh, Texas, who's also a hip surgeon, is also in our Zoom room. Uh, Sentel, uh, what do you, uh, you can pose your questions to Dr. Oliver. You need to unmute uh, Sentel first. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, so uh, no, nice, nice discussion, you know, like, I used to do hip scopes uh, for almost seven years ago, but then I've stopped doing it. I've kind of moved over to mini open uh, surgery. Um, what's your uh, take on doing hip scope for people with dysplasia and impingement? I like there's a kind of a uh, general uh, belief that if you do hip scope when they have dysplasia, you increase the instability. Uh, what's your take on it? because we make holes in the capsule and things like that. Yeah, uh, it's a good question. Thank you. Um, um, when you are talking about dysplasia, there is a wide range of dysplasia. It's not the same um, 22 lateral uh, center edge coverage than uh, 18, for example. So uh -huh. uh, you have less than 20, for sure you have to do uh, osteotomy. You have to correct the bone deformity and it is the only way to, to, to do it. But the problem is in these borderline dysplasias, you are not very gentle with this hip arthroscopy because always they, they associated this labor, contralateral junction uh, damage. So if you are not very gentle when you do a capsulotomy in these cases, you will create an more instability and you accelerate the degenerative uh, process. That's very common and published in the literature. So in this borderline, I'm talking about between 20 and 25 degrees lateral edge coverage. In these cases, usually are female, be, be, be very careful. Never do any kind of ring trimming, please. <laughs> That's very important because you will create more dysplasia. And when you manage the capsule, try to do very uh, short opening of the capsule there. Don't connect the portals and try to repair the labrum and, and everything correctly. Sometimes you need some kind of capsular closure or application. But in these cases, I'm not very comfortable doing that. I'm not a fan of uh, doing hip arthroscopy in dysplasia. I prefer to do a correction of the, of, the, of the bone deformity with osteotomy. And another topic in these cases is when to do a labral repair. When you are doing osteotomy, for example, if you propose osteotomy, you have to repair, open this labral damage that is always there or not. That's the problem. That's that's nice. Yeah, um, and uh, do you have any age limits on uh, your uh, hip arthroscopy patients? How old uh, youngest ones? How young you kind of go, and how old they you go up to? Yeah, that's another very interesting question. As I can see, you you are asking the hot topics of hip arthroscopy. So thank you so much. <laughs> you are my friend. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I mean, age limit is 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 uh, an issue. As I told you there, in US, in the registry of hypertroscopy, when they are increasing more than 300% the indication in over 60 cases, the, the conversion rate to total hip is more than 70. For me, it's not acceptable. So um, you have to see the space, joint space, or in the MRI, in the arthro MRI, the cartilage damage. If you have any doubt with this patient over 45, with any kind of, uh, damage of the of the college and you have some concern i never i never do the indication of hypertroscopy because it is very frequent that this patient will not work correctly and then um, as as i put in the presentation when you check this tennis zero tennis one cases very rarely i can find this tennis zero tennis one uh, joint space uh, cases in people over 40 over 50 it's very rare but there are some sports people over 50 with very, very good joint space. And then in these cases, I discuss with the patient pros and cons and try to, to see the expectation of the patient. And maybe 
In that case, we can, can do an indication over 50. But commonly, my patients are less than 40. That's very common. And uh, in the low part of the, of the, of the age, these adolescent or this kind of patients, also same stuff. Not, the age is not a reason to do a hip arthroscopy. Some people try to do a hip arthroscopy because the patient is 25 or something like that. So for me, it's not a good idea because if you have a very narrow space and the patient is 25, it will doesn't work anyway. So be very careful about the age. For me, it's not a, a clear limit, the age. Is more limit the the the, the articular uh, uh, joint and the cartilage in these patients. Well, thank you. Yeah. Um, how often do you kind of uh, end up finishing your hip arthroscopy and have to open it to do something, and how difficult it is after like you're spending some time uh, with the fluid in there? So, do you plan it in such a way that you decide that you're going to open it, or you do hip scope and then convert it into open in some cases? You mean open to do a PAO or, or you cannot continue with the hip arthroscopy or? Yeah, you've done a hip arthroscopy, um, done the femoral side and you say, okay, now I'm going to go do the established side or something. Have you ever, how often do you end up opening after a scope or you always complete it as a hip scope? No, never. When I do a hip scope in this patient, I do a hip scope. Uh, I don't have to open it. Uh, uh, some people do PAO, for example, the same time uh, they are doing hip scope. They do the hip scope first and then PAO. I'm uh -huh. not a fan of that. Uh, I prefer to do, if I have to do a PAO, I can open the joint for uh, this Smith-Peterson approach and then try to, to repair the labrum and the contralateral junction in this way. But uh, some people do it the same time. Some people wait like three months between the, the hip arthroscopy and then do the PAO because as you told me, uh, uh, the problem is the fluids. I think it's very dangerous to manage the anatomy with the, these fluids inside. And um, I think it's too risky to do it correctly. I prefer to wait. You have to do an open procedure after the hip arthroscopy or try to do with the same open procedure both sides. Great. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Oliva, one more question. What is the chance of breakage of instruments? Uh, because we know there's a small space in there. Is it, have you encountered a scenario where there's a breakage of instruments? Uh, this is another focus on my talk. I try to, to give you some tricks and tips about that. Um, it depends how rude you are doing hip arthroscopy. That's, the, that's the, the first stuff. If you are going like in a knee or just pushing again, and I mean, you have to treat that very gently, especially with this little guy. Be very careful with that. I mean, this is very flexible and it's very weak and you can break it. If you bend it, it's very easy to break it. Uh, so be very careful with the little guide. Be very gentle when you establish your portals. And, and that's, that's the key. Uh, the space is, is also very important to get a good space at the beginning. Don't try to get the space when you start doing your portals. Try to check before. Uh, just an, an example, I usually, it usually takes, takes me like one hour to prepare the case before I did I do my portal. I try to prepare by myself or the surgical field, the traction, I check like twice or three times the space that is correctly. Because when you start doing the surgery, it's very difficult to manage this problem with this loss of, of space during the surgery. Try to assess the, the, the boots that are correctly fixed and also to assess the, that, the, that the space is correct. So that's very important. Uh, because I remember, I mean, in the initial part, your first few cases, there's going to be a significant learning curve, isn't it? Yeah. But I remember I spent some time in the University of Jesus in Barcelona, and uh, you have the hip, uh, I, I know Manuel Ribas, I, I met him, and also the hip surgeon, and he told me that the first 300 cases, how difficult it was. And the surgeon who works with him, he told me I did, uh, 100 scopes, and even with the 101st scope, I, the initial 15 to 20 minutes is still difficult. Well, uh, that's another topic, the learning curve, and it depends on every surgeon. Some people is very experienced with the arthroscopy in the knees, shoulder, and, and all this stuff. So that's very useful for the technique. But uh, the problem is, uh, is how to assess the, the anatomical problem. That's 
in favor about uh, hip surgeons, just to know about the problem and indication. But for the learning curve, it's it's said that it's around 30 cases to be, be comfortable with the you know standard hip arthroscopy. But uh, if you practice in the cadaver, if you do visit other surgeons, you learn these tips and tricks. And in the last couple of years, there are a lot of very nice instruments from the companies that are that make it very easy to do it and avoid this complication. So I think actually for the standard uh, FII surgery, everything is easier. I mean, the, the, the anchors are very easy, not less. And I mean, the instruments, carve instruments, and everything is very easy. The manage of the capsule is also very easy. So I think it's actually the learning curve has improved and, and reduced for, for every surgeon who wants to start with that. So uh, the only problem is when you move from this indication, when you move from the standard FII. If you go to the structural uh, site or you go to the, I, I don't know, uh, super spine impingement or go further to other areas, that's, that's the problem. Because when you have your learning curve doing FII and you move to other indications, then you will start your learning curve. So you are always learning. Uh, thank you, Oliver. Any questions from Central? Um, what's your uh, traction, well, amount of uh, traction you use? How many pounds you use or in kgs? And uh, how long you try to keep your traction? What kind of time limit you try not to exceed? Yeah, that's another good topic. Um, uh, I know in US, they are now using, doing some hyperthroscopy without traction. Um, uh, to be honest, I don't use any kind of uh, measurement of the traction like that. Uh -huh. I just put my, as I, as I said in my presentation, I put the, the leg in abduction, ABD, and then do some traction and start the traction of the joint, and then try to change the vector, the traction vector to adduction. So this is very easy and it's very useful because you reduce the amount of traction changing your vector from abduction, separation of the, of the leg, to up, up ADD. So ADD. that's a very important point. And, and in this situation, I try to keep in traction. Uh, maybe sometimes you, I mean, it's safe to stay one hour, one and a half, and then change, the, release the traction, and then start doing like peripheral compartment. And then if you need, you can do traction again after 15, 30 minutes. So you can do like intermittent traction, I mean, chain from traction from peripheral compartment to central compartment. That's, that's interesting because if you do, for example, one of the tricks is to clean, if you, do, you start with the central compartment with traction, then you can clean the area between the capsule and the labrum, the sulcus. In this area, you clean nicely. When you release the traction, you have a virtual space there it's very easily to treat this tabular ring trimming or repair of the labrum or can deformity. So you can work with that traction for a long time if you clean this area nicely. That's, that's an important point. Also, if you don't open a lot the capsule, you don't connect the portals at that time, you clean this sulcus and you keep your portals very short. You can go to the peripheral compartment and there is an, a balloon effect of the capsule. That's this has been described by uh, Michael Deans in, in Munich. And uh, this balloon effect can show you the whole joint, I mean, for the can deformity and also for this lateral area and the tabular rim. So you can work without traction very nicely. So that's another trick. Also, you can manage the capsule opening and put some kind of sutures in both sides and try to do traction of that. There are many tricks, several tricks, just to work without traction. Just use the traction when you need it, just to check you don't get into the joint when you put the, your anchors or you check the cartilage or, you know, it's, it's to manage like an experience. I agree, you know, those are very important things. These are nice tricks because there's a pressure of time on you when you have the patient on traction, so, yeah. Uh, Sentil, I think we are almost uh, one hour into session and Oliver is, will be really tired and we are mm -hmm. asking too many questions. Uh, thank you, Oliver, for being with us. It has been a fantastic session on hip scopy. 
and I think uh, I think this is going to benefit a lot of people. And uh, we look forward for more from your side. And Central uh, Oliver has published a fantastic book on FAI, and he's really actively involved in book writing with ESCA. And we look forward uh -huh. for more lectures from your side, Oliver. And thank you once again for being with us. Thank you, sir. Yes, thank I you. Want to, I want to I want to thank you all of you for the invitation. And um, we can discuss whatever you want in any meeting or any Zoom in private uh, part. But I want to say thanks to all my Indian fellowship. I, I am very, I am very happy to have this Indian fellowship in my in my hospital many times. It's very, very funny to have people from from different parts of the world because I can learn a lot about how you, you your life is is usually. And I think it's very interesting to to try to spread the knowledge about hip preserving surgery. So thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you. No, no, thank, thank you. you. Thank you once again. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you.